Welcome to Sliders and Wings, a podcast about the TV show Sliders. And the TV show Wings. And all the other forgotten shows of the 90s. I'm Valerie Temple. And I'm Rachel Cox. How are you, Val? <laughs> Good. How are you, Rachel? Good. Nice to see you. It's nice. uh, been snowy here. Is it snowing there? Yeah, it's uh, terrible outside, actually. Uh, you know, like, I, it, it snowed. I'm like, okay, that's only a few inches. That's fine. I look out the window. It's still snowing. <sighs> Yeah. And as you know, I, I live in the Midwest now, but I still don't have a car <laughs> like a queen. And, um, I ride my bike everywhere and you can't really ride your bike. In, you can't like, get snow tires on them. I do like, I had to go to the library, uh, today because, uh, I'm a super user. I'm like, I'm like, <laughs> that's my, my friend who's a librarian. I was telling him, I think of a movie or something that I haven't seen. I'll, and it, I can't be bothered to look it up anywhere. I'll just request it from the library. So like now I have like seven library movies out at a time always. You're a dying and, breed. Yes, exactly. And he was just like, oh, you're a super user. <laughs> I was like, yeah, I will. <laughs> I will tell people I'm a super user, but I had to like take something back lest I get in trouble with the library. And um, that was quite a walk. So your carbon footprint is so low. I'm so jealous. I know it is so low. I think it's the, the secret to my success is um, not having to pay for a car. Well, we have a special guest with us today. His Yay. name is Bennett Madison. And we've known him for a very long time. Well, Bennett and I went to high school together. I didn't go to high school with Bennett, but, but I know a lot of people who went to your high school. So <laughs> or, or the last, last guest went to high school with me too. Exactly. Um, and Bennett is an author and a bon vivant in New York. <laughs> More of a bon vivant. The Fran Leibovitz of his days, generation. But... <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Hi, Bennett. How are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm sweaty. I'm in the hottest room of the house. That's why I keep disrobing. <laughs> this morning, since I knew what we were going to be doing this tonight, I was thinking about you and thinking about how uh, we used, Rachel used to drive me to school every day in high school because she, she was a year older and had a car and a driver's license. But you only had one cassette tape in the car. <laughs> there was only one cassette tape. So I think for two years... Every day we would drive to school to together and listen to the same Tiffany cassette tape. Yeah, it was Tiffany. Like it's you're look you're thinking about a span of a couple months and you've expanded it into two years. <laughs> Maybe that's true, but I do. Th I think we must have listened to that <sighs> Tiffany cassette tape. At What's least, your like, favorite you song know. from the, the um, album Tiffany by Tiffany? Uh, <laughs> oh, Jackie. Wait, how does it go? I'm not saying. Oh wait. <laughs> 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 you can convince me to do a podcast with I, you, but you're not I know it's just it, well now Tiffany I just really wish I could hear it she was really trying to like get you like gotcha <laughs> oh, Bennett Jackie. it's all about it's all about a friendship gone wrong Jackie's it's in the back of my mind I just can't bring it to the front but the one that that sticks out that I can always I can always recall is could have been because it was so also true. in a scene from Growing Pains where like uh, Tiffany did a guest star where she, where Kirk Ooh. Cameron was fantasizing about her, I think. I think he was well, fantasizing about her making pizza. too deep in the weeds, but it's confusing because that album has a song called Could Have Been and a song called Should Have Been. <laughs> yes. <laughs> really? <laughs> and one is sort of a ballad. I think the one you're talking about is more of a ballad, whereas the other one is sort of more of a, Up, uh, yes. a jazzy number. The way I remember the late 80s was that that, that there was this kind of it was like Nancy Kerrigan versus Tanya Harding, but it was Debbie Gibson versus Tiffany. And oh, Debbie wow. Gibson was like upper, upper class Connecticut girl who wrote her own songs. And Tiffany was trailer park mall whore. shows. Yeah, it was virgins like Tiffany was the whore and Debbie Gibson was a virgin. Yeah. That's why Tiffany was like the cool one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, we know that you and Lucy, your sister, also like Tanya Harding. So you always like the under underdog. So the, we are here to talk about picket fences. Yay. Picket Fences is huge to me because it was so weird. Because it's when you, if I guess at the time in the, wait a minute, let me pull it up. So for those who don't know what Picket Fences is, Picket Fences is an American family drama series about the residents of a town, Rome, Wisconsin, created and produced by David E. Kelly. So that's the guy who did Allie McBeal and The Practice. The 
Boston other, public, in Boston public, Boston legal. And it ran from 92 to 96 on CBS. Um, it was in this, this Wikipedia page says it's, it was in a Friday night death slot, <laughs> which I, I was my main at, slot. <laughs> yes. I looked at the same Wikipedia page and that the Friday night death slot has its own Wikipedia page. <laughs> okay. That one's blue. Can yeah. I can see it. Click the into it and <laughs> read about all of the shows that are lost to time because of that death slot. I mean, but, I'd be surprised if a good 50% of the shows you're talking about on here were not in that Friday night <laughs> death slot. I think every episode, every show so far we've talked about has been a failure on some level. Well, I mean, but that's why they're that's, forgotten. That's why they're forgotten. I or, mean, you know, but were they on Friday or Saturday night? I mean, I feel like I, those were Sliders the- Sliders was on Friday. The, it depends yeah. though, because like, okay, so TGIF was on Friday and there, there are, that's chock a block with shows everyone remembers. And then like, yeah, but X those were shows, those were for little kids. Right, true. You know, but like, X were home on Fridays. X Files was on Friday, so. Yeah, but it was for nerds. I mean, I think if the point <laughs> is like, if you, if it's a show for losers or a show for like little kids. Little kids, yeah. Those are the people who are home on Friday. Those are the people who are home on Friday. Yeah, the, right. the losers or... Little... Where were the other 15-year-olds on Friday nights? They're just <laughs> roaming around the mall, I guess. Probably. <laughs> but my my memory of picket fences was, you know, that I, I would have a sleepover. I'd have my friend Anna Marie come over and we would like stay up till 10 o'clock, which is when it was on, and eat cereal and watch picket fences. And that was my big week. I was so excited to get to Friday to watch picket fences because it had so much weird shit on it. Had like kind of like a patina of like sort of intellectualism too. I feel like at least that's what I thought at the time. I thought it was like really the height of sophistication. Well, it is critically acclaimed. Do you know it won like the Emmy for best dramatic series in its first two seasons? It won like a Golden Globe. Hmm. Yeah. So like people, the critics really liked it, but um, it didn't really just capture the popular imagination i was just sort of fascinated by picket fences every time i caught it i was like what is going on with this show it's so weird there's so much weird shit happening there's like the mom from what's even eating gilbert grape like rolling over and killing her husband or like there's it's, well it's kind of it's a it's it's labeled as a family drama but because one spouse in the family is a doctor and one is a sheriff and there's other right. characters who are sheriffs and there's lawyers then there's like legal stuff medical stuff and yeah, then there's they, teenagers right. and there's they teenage sort of mash stuff. up every kind of procedural right and plus like it's you can also see that it's like very clearly inspired by twin peaks you know twin peaks yeah. and also like northern exposure right with right. this like hmm. wacky town plus it like lays the groundwork for like david e kelly's like whole thing that he does which is this sort of like quirky mashing up of like wackiness with like controversial like of the moment issues approach right. in like a very sort of um you know, this idea that it sort of like represents the contemporary zeitgeist, which was like all, you know, what Ally McBeal was all about too. So right. this sort of like seems like it's like laying the path for all that while also being like pretty fucking bad. <laughs> <laughs> what? <laughs> Not... <laughs> oh no, <laughs> Rachel's gonna get sad. Um... I mean, I loved the show growing up. I felt my whole identity was like wrapped up in how much <laughs> I love the show, but I watched like several episodes in preparation for this, not just the one that we were supposed to watch. And all of them were bad in like totally different ways. I I do have to say that, okay, so I used to own the first season of Picket Fences. I bought it, I think last year at like a resale shop. And I was like, eh, fuck yeah, Picket Fences. I'm gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna watch Picket Fences, yes. <laughs> and then we watched like maybe the first three episodes and it was not good, like, and not in a fun way. So and it's really, really good at episode 17. I think the one so. That I, I mean, this, the, the, the episode that we did watch, which is episode 17, Be My Valentine, which is episode 17 of season one, was really good. <laughs> I have to say, I have to admit that, like, I just, I mean, it flew I by. enjoyed it. Was it. So good. Yeah. It was I, en I enjoyed it. I, I watched it twice, actually, <laughs> because <laughs> on valentine's day because i was watching it by myself and then it gets to the part 
where we kind of like no oh right we have a yeah. theme right i refuse to acknowledge the existence of valentine's day so right except exactly. for i go and get cheap chocolate yeah no i was watching it by myself on valentine's day and then and then it gets to a moment in the episode where i was like aaron has to watch this <laughs> so, so i like shut it off and i was like okay now we're watching picket fences together i'm seeing on the wikipedia page that don Cheadle comes in or you didn't he, know that? He, does he come in some well i for, i'm remembering all this stuff i i now have a vague memory of don Cheadle. yeah he was a lawyer he was like a da the other person who's in it who was not in this episode but who was in the next episode that i watched which really surprised me because i remember this character i just didn't remember that she was played by a very 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 young like eight-year-old elizabeth moss um, whoa oh i don't yeah. remember that what's at all. the character She's not like a major character. She's just like a character who like pops up memorably from time to time with like sort of like funny lines. She's like, um, she's like a little kid who's like obsessed with talking about sex. Who's like the mm. classmate of like one of the, yeah. you know, she's like, it's, I forget what her lines are, but she's kind of, you know, that type of little kid character Precocious. who's always like Precocious, yeah. penis and vagina, you know that. Yeah. Kind of Which thing. is funny because, okay, so the two kids of the what's the name of the the family so it's jimmy brock brock yeah played by tom scarrett uh then there's his wife who's a doctor kathy baker Baker, jill and then they've got two sons zachary and matthew and zachary is uh played by this kid named adam wiley who i just know as one of the kids from kindergarten cop so oh, which fine. yeah i've been meaning to watch kindergarten cop again actually it's I've, uh i've seen that i would recommend times. you watch it because it is it's a very strange movie because it is for children but it's also super fucking dark oh i know like there's like a heroin overdose in like the first 10 minutes and like there's a lot of like really disturbing violence and the like villain is uh very scary and then the, but then there's all this like fun stuff with like <laughs> with, like arnold schwarzenegger and like little kids and how cute and like in the bat like surrounding it is just all of this like really disturbing like sexual violence <laughs> it's like what what were they thinking with this movie um i i think that the the episodes that stick out in my mind like i remember them vividly and there was one sorry guys this is a spoiler for the people that haven't seen it they're like about to go buy the whole season all the seasons on prime oh yeah um (laughs) they can buy the one that i sold but there's okay so there's a episode where um, the the teen daughter who's played by Holly Marie Combs, whose name I can't remember, Kimberly, who everyone else it. knows from everyone else knows from Charmed, and I'm like, yeah. oh, you mean the girl from Picket from, Pencils? Yeah, right. Um, I think she tweets a lot too. Now <laughs> she does. She's one yeah. of those people. Yeah. She befriends a girl at school, and I I think like there's some insinuation that the, the her, that the girl's father has molested her or had sex with her. There's like an incest plot. And and then basically cut to the last the last scene of the show. It turns out that 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 she he's not her father. She's his second wife, and they're polygamists. Yep, yep. But it closes on that and doesn't resolve anything. <laughs> and like I probably came back the next week, being like, when are they going to resolve it and put this guy in jail? Uh-huh. And the other one was when Math, uh, the older son, is starting to get erections, and he gets an <laughs> erection in the locker room and all the kids start singing you've got that love and feeling <laughs> and i never heard that song before and in hindsight that's a strange song for a bunch of 10 year old boys to to sing about sing. like their classmate getting a boner yeah it's did very ha- like ally mcbeal though isn't it yeah did that happen to you bennett in the <laughs> locker room <laughs> I mean, I can't remember anyone like we never went to in the locker room. One. No, we I know. were in the locker room. We didn't get changed. I mean, like, no, we didn't take showers. Like, that's that wasn't a thing anymore. Um, like, why would you have a shower after running for ten minutes? Middle schoolers smell bad anyway. So, I mean, it's just like, why, why bother? Why Let's, add nudity to the mix? Let's, I mean, I remember a whole semester of gym class where I just sat around with my gym teacher, Miss Wolf, doing the crossword with her every <laughs> single day. <laughs> I remember, fun. I remember being called to the office in the middle of gym class in sixth or seventh grade, so, which meant I had to walk through the halls in my gym outfit, and 
when I got to the office, the principal was like, yeah, one of your teachers said that you, you seemed a little down lately. And I was like, and your solution to that was to make me walk through the halls in my gym shorts. Cool. Thanks. <laughs> Very cool. Oh, and in their, in their memory, they're like, there was this time I tried to help this. <laughs> she, <laughs> no. I tried. I tried so hard. Let's dig into the show. <laughs> okay. So the theme song is very bizarre. It's like a soap opera. Okay, actually, I know the one. It's really long. You got the whole thing. Wow. Yeah, it's stuck in there. Uh, I have an accent corner. Maybe I'll save it. <laughs> I do too. <laughs> Maybe it's the same accent corner. Is it Zelda Rubenstein? No. Oh. <laughs> it's Costas Mandalore. Okay. 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 So it's Valentine's Day episode. Right. Jill and Jill is the doctor. So this is the family at the core of the show. This is the married couple that's at the center of the whole show. Tom Skerritt, who I only know from the movie Poison Ivy, where he had sex with Drew Barrymore on a piano. Right. And yeah, I'll never forget the scene where like Drew Barrymore like takes off his toupee and it's... I don't remember that. Oh, I don't know if I want to watch it again. <laughs> no, <laughs> but uh, there. Anyway, he gets. Ugh, I don't. We don't need to get into the details, but he gets shot by an arrow. He gets shot right in the ass, and an a arrow. few people get shot in arrows. And it turns out there's. Don't this... forget, he's the town sheriff. Yeah, he's, yeah, he's sheriff. the town sheriff, and like it's he. Strange he, town. <laughs> it's a strange town, Rome, Wisconsin, and he like he and his wife Kathy Baker are having like. A lovely night out and she's talking it almost seems like it's improv dialogue they seem kind of like talking over each other a little bit in a weird way and she wants to renew her vows which i think it might be a nine might be the most 90s 90s thing of the episode People renewing your vows doing that i know um but like all of us you know he's like okay i'll i'll marry you again and then he gets shot right in the took us with an arrow and then immediately we see um i can't remember her name either lauren holly's character maxine maxine max so she's the deputy so there's there's the the sheriff and then there's these two deputies played by lauren holly who's got the red hair and she's she's known for being the girl from dumb and dumber the love interest mm -hmm. who then married jim carrey and she was yes. married to him for a while um and Costas mandalore is like the super hunky italian american guy accent corner okay so he's australian <laughs> He is. That's what his bio wow. says. And usually Australians are so bad at trying to do New York accents, but his New York accent is so good. Oh. Well, he doesn't talk very much. He doesn't. He's sort sure. of like truly just meant to stand there and look beautiful, which he does pretty well. But uh, he's not. He's just. He's, he's a he's big. He's not a man slab. of many words, at least no. in this episode. He is wearing a beautiful cardigan in that first episode. It's. I don't know. He just looks so stylish. And he's like in a little waiter outfit at one point. And it's, <laughs> yeah. But, right. That is they, the point of his character. They I know, dress him up in different they, costumes. They, they know like, what they're doing. They're like, look at this like cutie, cutie, cute, cute, you know? <laughs> well, they do a whole will they, won't they with the two deputies because they're like two in incredibly intelligent, interactive people that work together every day that seemingly have no interest in each other. Yeah, I mean, the, the episode hinges on the idea that Lauren Holly is so lonely that she placed a personal ad to find love. And in doing so, she was ensnared by a serial killer named Cupid, or like is in the sights of a serial killer. Not because just she, a serial killer, but a serial killer who also goes around like shooting other random people with arrows. I feel like they never no tied reason. that in correctly. It doesn't they seem didn't. like this person's MO. They sort of like say it, you know, like like real fast in the beginning where they're like, oh yeah, yeah, he taunts the police every time he comes around. Like, <laughs> what? Are okay. And, and like, uh, Jimmy gets shot and then the district attorney, the FBI agent gets shot. That's right. And no one even tries to like run out and pinpoint the location of where it came from 
no and they're just like we'd never find it forget it <laughs> what's the point yeah jimmy was like it's one of the kids around the block like arrest him like <laughs> so like okay. she like decides to go undercover and like find this but like... wait she put the ad out without any kind of plan she put the ad right. out for a personal reason but no, then it... someone responded saying he was cupid and now she thinks and then and then jimmy got shot in the butt and then she says i think that he's come to rome to kill somebody well he responded with like a ransom note response that also (laughs) quotes like robert frost and she's like okay one i know that he is a poetry lover poetry lover (laughs) he goes after poetry lovers you're like okay and then also and then also look how weird this note is and that this must be a serial killer and you're like yeah she's right <laughs> it doesn't really make a ton of sense that like if you were a serial killer trying to like ensnare people who you met in the personals that you would like arrange the meeting with them by sending them like a like ransom the, note style thing but like you know, the creepiest note you could possibly send yeah. like this I guess some come- girls find that hot i don't know <gasps> Yeah, I, I feel like we'd have to take a poll. Like, if is there a girl out there that would be like, "All right, I like his creativity. He used glue. He cut. He he clearly he owns magazines. Look at this guy. You know, oh, what, Bennett, what did you text me last night or the other night? Yeah. So when when Maxine is reading the letter to, oh my God, I can't remember their names. The other deputy guy, the hunky deputy guy. She said, a road less traveled. That's a line from a Robert Frost poem. Cupid is using it metaphorically. <laughs> oh, yeah, I love that. Metaphorically. <laughs> I know. I don't even really know what that means, but <laughs> I don't think she did either. But yeah. <laughs> she she thinks she knows something. She's like, is this an elegy? <laughs> um oh, and she goes to research him using <laughs> microfilm. So poor girl. Oh, um, um, Val, this is your seg- section. Do we have to do your? Do we have to do your section? What's the most nineties thing? Is that at the end? Oh yeah. Okay. No, we can do it whenever. Um, so, so I nominate yeah. the most nineties thing: microfilm. Sec- second oh, nomination microfilm? is classified ads. She says she goes to look at <laughs> the goes to the library, looks at microfilm of the old murders. My nomination for the most nineties thing in the episode, and since I watched the episode twice. This is why I noticed it, um, was Stephen Tobolowski's blue and green and white vertical striped sh- button-down shirt oh. uh, <laughs> with a oh, oh. tan jacket that had a leather collar. <laughs> yeah, so he was just like, it was just like peak picking my son up at Boy Scouts dad yeah, what do you call that and shirt it's kind of it, i know you're talking about like the color block know. um is it crew neck with a collar no this was like a collared shirt and it was just like it was but it was a long like sleeve those, polo. like 90s collars yeah 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 that is 90s too okay. so that's my what Be- bennett do you have a most 90s thing of the episode i don't think what? i do although i do have an accent corner which okay. is i noticed that lauren holly like had a little Wisconsin accent, which I don't know if that was like, you know, if, if she really has an accent or if she's doing it because she's playing this Wisconsin cop, but I was sort of impressed by it. It was about she's, the only thing she's about from, her that I thought was impressive, but. Did you know that she went to Sarah Lawrence? I did know that, I forgot about that. <laughs> she went to, she's from, <laughs> well, she, you know, Wikipedia always says where someone's born. So she was born out, outside of Philly. I, I also mm. noticed that too, and I thought, Okay, she was raised in Geneva, New York. I mean, it sounds kind of like, she sounds like a Midwestern accent, which they do have in the Buffalo area as well. Right, I mean, that's they do true. sound like that. And that's maybe, you know, maybe that's not a real accent, but she was just able to do it really well. But yeah, she's like- I mean, she's... good for her. Good for her. Good job, Laura. Uh, I mean, otherwise I thought she really sucked. Like, <laughs> like... Say that again. Why? Say that again. I thought she sucked, like, especially like compared to the rest of the cast. I feel like, you know, Tom Skerritt and Kathy Baker do not, are not in this episode a lot. They're kind of, I mean, this is actually, I think, kind of an unusual episode because. It is, yeah, because it's just like, there's like five-ish Finkels not in it a lot. And I right. remember him being all over every episode. <laughs> right. It really focuses on like Lauren Holly and Costas Mandalore's characters who are like, usually I would say like sort of more second string characters. Yeah. And thing about this show is like it's really tonally weird right on one hand it's like extremely wacky there's like a very high wackiness quotient but at the same time it like 
tries to be sort of like serious minded like yeah. a lot as well and I think like Kathy Baker and Tom Skerritt are both really able to sort of like walk that line by mm-hmm. sort of just being like breezy and saying everything with like a little bit of a wink whereas like Laura and Holly I just felt like I had no idea like <laughs> where she was she how was to do it to playing it yeah. yeah and and it really I think like made it hard you know because everything she does is like extremely stupid and unrealistic right like (laughs) throughout this episode like no no normal person like much less police officer would behave this way but like I think another actor could have sort of like made it all seem just like a big goof whereas she sort of see acts kind of like she's trying to like she thinks she's on a real cop show she really did well I mean I don't know it like I had a hard time with it too because it does feel like the show itself is making fun of her and I'm like isn't she a main character like, like yeah she seems how like could you say that she's, Dodo. how could you say that she's not doing a good acting job when Zelda Rubenstein is also in the show I mean, <laughs> she is literally I just saying that. lines with no voice modulation or inflection whatsoever. Right. And I she's know, like, that's like real camp. I mean, Zelda, every time Zelda <laughs> Rubenstein love... shows up, it's just like true camp. Kind she of. had the funniest line of the episode, what, which was, she was like talking because she has psychic episodes, of course, because she, she wasn't poltergeist so like obviously that carried over i forgot all Um, about her with her psychic abilities me too and um and she but she has had this vision that lauren holly is in danger and she's trying to tell tom scarrett like she's in danger like we gotta do something and i think tom scarrett says something like oh like you know i've been incapacitated or something and she's like yeah that's because you stayed home with your rectal wound really made me laugh <laughs> it Wait, i have another nomination for for the most 90s thing they yes. say that the serial killer who they call cupid he's a four-star hacker <laughs> yes this guy can do everything he's also a four-star hacker well we'll learn why he can do the jobs of two men i thought that there was a scene when <laughs> um when lauren holly they they try to do the first i mean this all takes place within like a couple of days but yeah they do the first sting operation she goes to the restaurant and then her the guy whose name i can't remember the other deputy he's playing a waiter and the the, the cupid guy is supposed to meet her i'm confused there's multiple guys meeting her but they're going to try to determine which one they think is the serial killer and they're going to nab him or or, well i think what she's done is she's placed another ad in the newspaper saying like like dear cupid like i would like to meet you at this place in time like please like come meet me under the assumption, I guess, that like only Cupid, Cupid the would serial come. killer will know that she's talking to him. But in fact, like every man in town basically sees and, it and, and thinks, one lady. And Let one me just and, oh yes, she's so rude to that oh, poor oh, lesbian. Yeah, I know. She's like, uh, uh. Hey, I'm like, know, okay. The fact like, that, she that lady seems so nice. She was just like, I you know, it could be a you could like women, you could like men. I thought that was handled That's- pretty well considering we're talking about 1992. I mean, I mean she's like, not a serial killer, unlike that, the other gays in the episode. But, but here's the basic plot, just because we're about to because spo- we're spoiling it out of out of order. Basically, she goes a little trouble to trap this guy. Then they think that they find the guy because he kind of threatens her and attacks her. Turns out he works for the FBI. But then when they go to ask the other FBI guy, the FBI guy says he was he was fired months ago because he's unprofessional and he's obsessed with trying to catch and, the Cupid because the Cupid killed his wife. And that guy, by the way, is played by Kurtwood Smith. Who, who plays the dad on the 90s on that 90s on that that eight, that's that 70s, eight, 70s show. show that's 70s show also he was the villain in robocop so for a while they're they're trying to work with this guy it's hard because i can't remember anyone's names the main fbi guy who will look very familiar to everyone because he's been in everything but i can't remember his name either he says we already caught cupid the guy that you think is cupid is not cupid we've already caught him he's dead yeah we and then this other fbi killed. guy says no there's no evidence you've even caught him because you it, he was this it's, it's so boring but like they don't he doesn't think it's him and he's still out there we got to catch him he killed my wife and these two guys are arguing and then but they happen to be arguing at the rome police station and the rome police station is like we don't know who to believe basically it's very twisty turny oh it's, it's very that, right but then they think that fbi knows. guy too is who the killer is and every time she kind of thinks she knows who the killer is it like pulls like a reversal kind right. of right because 
they think Lauren Holly's like, okay, this guy, this guy's going to help us. And then I guess like Kurtwood Smith says something to the main FBI yeah, guy. He's like, the oh, he's taunting you. He if, sent you a, if, a letter. He's like, if Cupid's dead, why did he send you a Christmas card? And then like, uh, Kurt so Smith, murder she wrote. Yeah, Kurt Smith's well, out right. of the I room, mean, and he's like, "I didn't. I, I never told anyone that he sent me a Christmas card. Oh, that must be him, you know." So, so then they go forward with a sting. With that, <laughs> it's so complicated. They try to sting this other guy also, in order to trap the first guy. So let's go back, actually. So like this, this sting operation that Lauren Holly sets up in this bar is like based on a, a, a an al pacino movie called sea of love with like al pacino and ellen barkin and uh she basically is has sent sent out this you know new personal ad and said hey keep it come meet me and so then she just has a series of meetings with people and two of them seem very strange like are kind of weird guys kerwood smith and steven tobolowski are both like seem kind of weird and but like regardless of that they're taking the drinking glasses of everyone who sits down to talk to lola is i think her like pseudonym yeah. is lola yeah. And, and so, you know, they are taking the fi fingerprints and are trying to match those to Cupid, which I don't think they ever do. No, but it's kind of a smart way of, in like a, you know, 40 minute TV show of to, like setting up a whodunit because yes. you get to trot out like a bunch of different characters, including like a few characters who are like regulars on the show who like right. they get to sort of like cast a little bit of suspicion on even if you know it's not real suspicion, but sort of you get to, they get to sort of set up the parade of suspects in a whodunit kind of way. Then they narrow it down right. pretty quickly to like a few who like the viewer then spends the rest of the show ideally like flipping back and forth kind of in your mind of like, oh, is it him? But no, that's too obvious. So it has to be the other one. And then right. it sort of like plays that game like throughout until at the end and, and i think it's pretty good that way actually yeah. because it, it's like even though okay so like the first guy who shows up by the way is like a regular cast member named carter he's like the mortician he's so good i'm yeah, I love that. immediately very affectionate for that guy with his like really super like but chin but yeah um thing going on and he was so cute and you know, I'm looking for Lola, and she's like, what are you doing here? He's kind of introduced to just sort of, like, get Lauren Holly to tell us what she's up to. She's like, hey, I'm here on a sting, you know? And then there's this, like, parade of people that come through, and even though the two people that viewers would probably recognize, sort of, like, in a Columbo way, where you're like, oh, you mean the, the guest star is the one who did it? You know, <laughs> even though that is true you've got these two people that you know and you do they do a great job of making you kind of switch back and forth like maybe he did it i'm questioning this i don't know like what going back and forth so it is really well done that way and it also feels like the other fbi agent who's like the real fbi agent feels like a somewhat plausible suspect at like various yeah. points also i thought so it's like he always seems very nervous sort of, and sweaty so and yeah, also I mean, they do a good job of like laying out like the different sort of like suspects and scenarios it's just that the premise is like totally ridiculous yes exactly the fbi agent when they put her up to the sting and, and and tom scarrett the sheriff is really upset because he, he feels very paternally towards her and like he has to take care of her he said can you guarantee your safety he's like no i can't <laughs> <laughs> like, i mean like, you're no. the fbi i mean you could have like 10 more guys here i guess i mean and could... they were very bad at uh keeping her safe no really, um so. so there was a uh, a, a brief period when I thought that maybe I would watch this with my six-year-old Oscar because <gasps> well it was on CBS it probably doesn't have any like real gore or sex or anything in it and then I got to the part where Carter says I know everything about the Cupid I know he prefers rape to intercourse because he doesn't like vaginal fluid and I was like I'm really <laughs> glad I did not <laughs> watch I was I was going to say that, like, they totally, the way that they kind of threw around the word rape 
and like casually mentioned rape a lot it was just sort of like odd like it kind of <laughs> it kind of like took me aback it's just really gross I mean I'm pretty yeah. sure this show's gross I mean that's probably why it interested me gross and also just weird enough that you're like what happened you know but the big twist is that the two guys that they can't decide which one is Cupid they're both Cupid and they've been yes. working together they've been working together and then they kiss yes. and the only way that, that was- is able to get away is because she has this pen gun that's right. I guess illegal and she shoots one of them with it and then pulls the gun on the other one. It's not just a pen gun. It's a pen. It's a gun disguised as a pen disguised as a tampon. <laughs> yes. Oh, okay. It did is. You, did you did you miss where she like? It's a tan. Yeah, it's like it's. Yes. it's that is her it's, other hand. Okay. That was another thing where okay, so Cupid. There's a lot of like a lot that they talk about. Like Cupid does this. Cupid is that wants this from his victims, and he. Cupid wants his victims to trust him and he wants his victims to be like virginal or clean or something. And so when she's finally like faced with these two guys, like, uh uh-oh, I thought it was one, then I thought it was the other. Now it turns out it's both of you working together. She's like, well, I'm not clean. I'm on my period. And like, there's a lot of talk about her being on her period. And then she like pulls out this tampon and it turns out to be a gun. She shoots him with this I tampon mean, they really, gun. They, they could have spent an extra five or 10 minutes or a few extra scenes doing more profiling stuff. Cause they really just intersperse all the stuff they know about Cupid throughout the whole episode. And it's just, you don't really have time to absorb any of it. Right. Well, I mean, this is also a very typical for this show. Like over the course of its run, very many, many, wacky criminals with like strange like mo's kind of like um right. and even in this first season i think there's several episodes like this like there's this there's one about a uh, a bandit who leaves dead frogs everywhere he goes there's um <laughs> there's also like marley matlin the um oscar winning deaf actress yes. plays someone called the dancing bandit who's like a <laughs> like a deaf criminal who dances to music somehow and doesn't she end up becoming mayor at some point probably she's a recurring character on the show i mean i think she's like a recurring guest star who like maybe eventually joins the cast by the end so the idea that there's like a serial killer with like very you know a very sort of you know siri pops up every time i say serial killer but um uh that there's a serial killer with this very specific set of you know, rules about like how he's going to kill the people is like very, very typical of this show yeah. too. And I think that they like they're able to sort of rest on it because even by the seventeenth episode, you kind of can be like, You're oh, like, it's all another, right, yeah, it's, it's one another of the. I think wacky that, criminal. I think that you can just from so on the Wikipedia page for picket fences, it talks about there's a whole section about the mayors of Rome, Wisconsin. Because apparently every mayor meets like a really, like they all sort of die or are removed in very weird ways. And I think just like reading what happens to each of these care, each of these mayors just like gives you a good snapshot of what Picket Fences is about. Uh, There's, so the first one, spontaneous human combustion after his murder conviction. Number two, hounded from- Hounded from office for starring in an adult film. I used to be so scared of spontaneously combusting. <laughs> Stop, Rachel. I'm not because there was like a book about spontaneous combustions in line at the grocery store once when I was a kid. Yeah. <sighs> what well, you do? Something you can do. You it happens or it doesn't. Spontaneous. And then, okay, so the number three, suffered from Alzheimer's disease, fatally shot by his son. So not only did he have Alzheimer's, but he was also fatally shot. Okay, then... Uh, uh, Kathy Baker was briefly mayor, I guess, and she was jailed and dropped out of bid for re-election. Okay. And then the next mayor after her was entombed in a freezer by his wife, then decapitated. (laughs) Then Marley Matlin's mayor, mayor end of third season. So all of this is, uh, the rest of these have happened before the end of the third season. (laughs) Which is when David E. Kelly leaves the show. I think the fourth season is a different 
writer yeah. and showrunner and so it's kind of like not the same show after that but. that's that's right so the marley matlin mayor at the end of third season despite bank robbery convictions as the dancing bandit she was offered the job as part of her three thousand hours community service sentencing <laughs> then lauren holly's the mayor she's shot and wounded by a shock jocks fan and then uh marley matlin uh, is the mayor at the end of the series <laughs> So it's just like I feel like that just like gives you everything you need to know about what's going on in Rome, Wisconsin at any given yeah. day. <laughs> um, which other episodes did you watch, Bennett? The ones you just so mentioned. The other episode I watched, um it was very typical of the show in a different way because it sort of takes two very like hot button, like 90s sort of um sort of like social issues one of which is like religion in schools they're putting on like a christmas pageant and um but the rabbi sues the town to like prevent them from like putting on the christmas pageant which like triggers like all this sort of like you know 90s style like liberal hand wringing about well we believe in you know respecting religion but we also want to have the christmas pageant so then they have to go arrest the teacher who is like um throwing the Christmas pageant, who refuses to cave on the issue. But, and this is where the episode really gets going, in the course of arresting the teacher, they investigate her background and discover that um, she is a transgender woman, at which point <sighs> the sort of like, like the, basically they spend the rest of the episode like having like- Guessing this is an a, actual female actress. Yes, okay. and they were, yes. And they spend the rest of the episode sort of like debating whether it's okay to be like prejudiced toward her or not. With, like, <laughs> oh mixed, my God. Like mixed results. I was actually really glad that this was not, we didn't accidentally watch this episode because it really would have been, I think, torture to talk about kind of because it's sort <laughs> Yeah, of like, like what they were doing. <laughs> like, you know, it's very 90s in this way, but it's also shocking in the sense of like, if this were on TV now, like people would lose their minds because, right. you know, in the end, of course, in the end, of course, the town <laughs> decides like we will they not shouldn't they shouldn't be prejudiced toward her <laughs> but like oh but good it like, takes them a lot <laughs> to get there and it's really it's really they all have kind of like decided to like cast her out until <laughs> finally like um kimberly played by holly marie combs shows mm -hmm. up as mary in the christmas pageant oh it's a christmas gives, miracle it's a christmas like, kind miracle of, yeah, like a speech about like acceptance and whatever and then they all feel very ashamed and change their minds and like and then the trans teacher gets up on the stage during the pageant and sings a song with them. And then the whole town gets up on the stage and sings with them. Um, and that I think is like, it really is a, like- She sings I Born think, This Way by Lady Gaga. <laughs> basically, I can't remember what <laughs> yeah. the song is. Um, but, you know, I think the show does a lot of that of like sort of like introducing these like topical issues of the moment and then having- Sort of like, a- a weird quirky spin on it and like yeah it's always like there's a child molester who moved next door like well like sh should we what should we do about this and then they all sort of have to decide like do we you know ostracize this person or not or it's it's always some sort of like ripped from the headlines thing yeah. that it's sort of like a topic for kind of like like well-meaning like liberal like types to sort of like debate and um like be conflicted over and show their sort of like hypocrisy in a way while also just like being very like, you know, being assholes kind of. It actually reminds me a lot of The Good Wife, which does that mm -hmm. in like a much smarter, like more- um, Controlled you know. way. I felt like this show is like a little like, it's just so all, all over the place, you know? There's just like so much going on. I mean, I the episodes I remember are all like courtroom episodes, you know, where you've got Fivish Finkel and you've got Don Cheadle and they're like arguing some case. But then like you've got like stuff going on. You've got like this like Gilmore Girls type town where you like everyone's being goofy all over the place. And then, you know, you've got like cop storylines. It's just, there's just a lot going on. I... Well, there's like, for instance, there's another sequence of episodes, like in the third season, I think when Kathy Bates is mayor and the town is ordered to like bus in 
children from another town to go to their school to like add racial diversity to the school oh. and again it's this whole thing of kind of like all the characters being like well we believe in diversity in our school but we don't like want like actual black children like coming from the next <laughs> no. town over to go to our school and it's like the show never quite settles on whether like pro or con like the, the moral is well it's more like the moral of the story in like many of do they say that though bennett or like, are they just do, is it veiled are they saying do they say we don't want black kids there or do we, they say we just don't want anyone to feel uncomfortable and people should it would make well, well i mean it's i mean i can't remember i haven't seen no. episodes in a long time but i think they're not they're not like they don't beat around the bush that like racism is like the sort of like central issue okay. that is being like debated but like kind of the way the show works is like the characters always go back and forth and like sort of like show their like hypocrisies in a way that I think David E. Kelly really likes doing you'll see him do that on like basically every show he's ever oh done. yeah he loves but, to have like someone acting wild and then like everyone else be wringing their hands about it right and like and then and then like the person acting wild somehow has like a redeeming quality that or like a, does something redeeming and then everyone else is like thrown into a tailspin about how to react to that person in the end they're all ultimately like good people and it sort of never really got to the question of like other shows do much better that come later it's like sort of are they're sharper in their criticism whereas the show like can never quite get to the point where it's being critical toward the characters i think yeah i mean i haven't you know i've only seen this one based on what you're saying that doesn't sound that bad to me because it sounds like well you know not everything in life is black and white i'm not even it's sure not so bad i mean no that's what either that's what the show is trying to say and do and like it's just and i think at the time it was like sort of like that was why people liked it was because mm -hmm. it was sort of taking on those questions and doing it in a kind of like great you know way that is presenting a gray area you know you watch watching it now you're just sort of like it just feels very ham-fisted and like like well a lot of the issues they're dealing with are things that have kind of been settled you know there yeah. there are social issues that for the most part have been settled <laughs> yeah. um but the one that i remember another one i remember very vividly is can a man like can a man be i call it the can a man be raped episode but there was this right. of course, couple they were on a that. date or something of course and they had sex and then he said she raped me and she said well how could i have raped you you had an erection i couldn't have had sex with you if you didn't have an erection he said but i said no she said but you had an erection and i mean I, this was just so titillating i mean could you think of anything more titillating to a 12 year old than listening to this conversation <laughs> you're like oh also, i bet you they did I, th I feel like they did that exact same thing again on ally mcbeal like, i think so later. too doesn't I that feel exactly like an ally mcbeal episode absolutely and it's well like, there's just so he much recycles himself a lot i think yeah there's so much to mine there well like that guy has had a million shows so he was I actually mean... just looking i mean he's still did so you many know, shows did you know he co-created doogie hauser yeah. Did you know this? I didn't. Oh, so but I never watched Yugi Hauser. His, I think, you know, most recently, his most recent hit was um, Big Little Lies, the HBO right. show. And then he also did The Undoing. He was like the executive oh, producer right. or something for The I Undoing. Can't, I don't watch anything. I can't watch them. I can't watch <laughs> Nicole Kidman. <laughs> did you know that there was almost sort of a pseudo crossover episode for Picket Fences and X-Files? I did know that, but I can't remember the details. Even though they're different networks? It's different networks. I guess, like, David E. Kelly and Chris Carter, like, ran into each other in the parking lot of, like, you know, Hollywood, I guess. <laughs> like, they were on their way to their jobs in Hollywood. This says they, they, had, they had two crossovers with Chicago Hope. Right. There were, there were two actual crossovers with Chicago Hope, which was also a David E. Kelly show. But then, like, with X-Files... They thought it would be interesting. They both, like, agreed, like, it would be cool if we could do a crossover. It's kind of like, it would be interesting if you could get, like, Mulder and Scully to Rome, Wisconsin, because it seems like a place that they would go. And so, and, like, their, their idea was to, like, each write an episode where it's, like, the same story, uh, but from the different shows perspectives and I guess it like just sort of like didn't really happen but like there are two episodes that um are about cows that like are vaguely like 
just like that was what the result was is that like they're sort of related and like what did they cut (laughs) the picket fences episode vaguely references x-files characters and things like that but like the one the x-files episode does not say anything about picket fences so. oh man so many cr- so many crossover oh, weird. discussions yeah good thing we'll be I discussing love, crossovers so much i love crossovers <laughs> they're my favorite <laughs> the I mean, the episode of picket fences that i remember the most and i feel like this it might have been i don't know if it was because it was a multiple episode arc or if it was just like what happens in the episode was so disturbing to me it just felt like it carried over to multiple episodes but the oldest son Matthew makes a potato gun I remember and this. shoots someone like he's shooting it off at school or something or at like a playground and he like catches like he accidentally shoots a classmate and cripples them (laughs) i remember the potato gun i don't know if i I don't remember the crippling part yeah he's and and i just remember being so or or he's crippled like like there's just something i gotta figure that one out but like that one that was the one where i was like oh my god he was also um somewhat recently like you know, recently meaning, I guess, like 13 or 14 years ago, was on uh, Millionaire Matchmaker and was a real, a true, one of the worst people she's, you know, Patty Stanger ever encountered. Oh my, God. are you kidding? He was a yeah. Millionaire Matchmaker? Yeah, oh. I don't think Wait, she who was a match. The, oh, the, the, the older brother. Oh, I don't think gosh. she's able to make a match for him because- She doesn't match too, anybody. He's, he, well, he's a real handful. Oh boy. You guys, the name of that episode is Guns Are Us. <laughs> Come on. The episode shows how guns Matthew's attempt to get revenge for humiliation by some high school bullies lands one of them in the hospital, which causes the teen's younger brother to seek his own revenge. I guess this is, was just a really great show for a teenager to watch because it just it was like this light introduction to all these adult issues. It is sort of like a kid version of Twin Peaks. I don't know. As it- Twin Peaks isn't about anything though. Twin Peaks is just nonsense. Yes, that's true, but... This is about real stuff. Well, it takes the small town coziness of Twin Peaks and sort of tries to graft on this, like, um, like Rachel said, like the cop show, the doctor show, the lawyer show, and the small town show, and kind of, like, puts them all together. And, like, each episode, you never know kind of, like, what combination of those things you're going to get, but it's, right. you know, you always get some combination of... of that and you know we didn't even see the episodes where they go to court and like you know ray walston is the judge right Finkel's a lawyer don Cheadle appears in later seasons as the other lawyer and also like as a kid having kids in the cast also helps you <laughs> well yeah like, it oh, also okay. like opens up another avenue for like you know then sometimes they like there's a controversy in the school or whatever and kimberly right. the older sister is always getting into you know, lesbianism, polygamy, all those kinds of things. Abortion. I'm sure she had an abortion oh, or two. I, I mean, like she I always would... is. Uh, she's always up to like one of those things, basically. Um, <laughs> and she's a bad egg. And yeah, I mean, if you're a teenager, it, like both is like it's like, especially if you're a young teenager, I would say it's like titillating. Mm-hmm. But it also has this like veneer of like sophisticated, like oh, we're like talking about the real issues like lesbianism abortion and yeah i read about these things in the Christmas news pageant. in my civics class we right. had to- the Ki- right. kimberly character is she's so calm and adult for a teen though like she was very off-putting she wasn't she didn't act like a teenager at all she was always very eerily calm i kind of li- liked her i kind of thought she was like i don't know i thought she like kind of sold whatever she was selling she's calm but she's always like doing crazy shit i never knew like uh at, like a cool older sister or brother ever like, <laughs> like and so I was always, I always saw them on TV and stuff and I was like wow what would that be like like I wanted neat. an older brother so for a while I wanted my parents to adopt a teenage boy <laughs> <laughs> well, that was the only way that I could get an cool older, older sister yeah like, you were not, right not to like you know pump up her ego or anything but Rachel's a year older than me and is you know is an older sister and I was actually, you, I was often around Rachel's younger sister 
more because she was friends with my younger sister and so Rachel did and Rachel she had a perm she had glasses <laughs> she had a Nintendo like all the things like a co- cool older sister would have I love this I, I list I of cool things <laughs> I love this list of cool things like a perm glasses Nintendo <laughs> but then when I was 15 and everyone wanted to sneak out to Jackie Park to smoke weed I wanted to stay in and watch Picket Fences can you imagine having like Picket Fences like trading herds <laughs> I definitely would have purchased them. I think I would have. I I think I would have. I Sarah and I used to buy magic cards, which were trading cards that just had different bands on them and different bands. It never really took off. Yeah, it just had musicians on them. Not Magic the Gathering. Oh wait, music cards. What did I okay. say? You, you said magic. And <laughs> music I was like, what? cards. Okay. But it was clever because there's only one C. Music cards. Huh. Not music cards. Yeah, there were a lot of trading cards back then that that never really took off. I I, uh, found my brother brought up a whole bunch of my old crap that was at my my mom's house. And um, I had, for some reason, I had like a ton of baseball cards. I don't know why at all. Um, But mixed in were pretty much a full set of 90210 baseball cards or 90210 trading cards. Yeah, those were great. So like a Steve Sanders (laughs) Trading card. I just sold my garbage pail kids on Depop. Whoa. Did you get a lot of money? No. Yeah. I just I listed them and they were on there for so long. And then someone tried to negotiate with me and I was like, fine. I just <laughs> I don't I don't like I saved them for my kids and now I think I don't want my kids to play with these. <laughs> They're so dumb. Um, we forgot one section, Val, which is what you're watching. Oh yeah. What you watching, Bennett? <laughs> um Nothing. I mean, isn't this the problem right now? Like, we've come to the, I have come to the end of television. Like, there's, <laughs> yes. There's nothing really to watch. I mean, John and I watched, I, I'd never watched Fleabag, so John and I watched oh, Fleabag, and it's great. I don't but like I mean, Fleabag. Uh, you know? I can see, I can see why you, I, I can see why one wouldn't. I like I it except when it. she talks to the camera. I don't like it when she talks to the camera. It's but, good. It's yeah. I don't I don't you normally like it when they talk to the camera, but I think that this, that show pulls it off you very don't, elegantly. You don't like uh, what's his name? Uh, Kevin Spacey in House of Cards. No, <laughs> no I don't. <laughs> you remember him? Remember him? I, remember him? I, 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 no, I don't I remember swear, him very I well because I stopped watching that show after four episodes. Before, I never watched it. But. I never watched it because it just didn't seem like something that I would care about. And then when all that happened, I was like, I'm glad. I watched a show called this called It's a Sin, which is on HBO Max, which is about like AIDS in the 80s. And it's getting very good reviews. I thought it was also very bad. Um, and yeah. I think that's it. I don't Instagram know really wants me to watch Euphoria on HBO okay. Max. Mm, and I'm bad. 40 years old. Like, why would I want to watch Euphoria? It's, it's I don't want to watch anything with teenagers. Like, I have no interest in anything teenagers are doing at all. Me neither. Me neither. Um, Seen and not heard. What about you, Val? <laughs> uh, so I've, I've just mostly been c- catching up on, like, library movies that are due. Um, but, <laughs> and also floundering after finishing ER. Oh, but, I needed- forgot. I have been watching ER. You've been watching ER. Yeah. <laughs> Thank yes. you. Are you guys going to start another podcast? <laughs> I, I just- totally would. <laughs> oh, my God. That would be incredible. I have so much to say about that show. You have no idea. I like- mean... The show is it's really so good. excellently done. Like, yes. I don't think I realized at the time like how well they did it because it really holds up m- better than it, almost anything from that era. It, probably because of the production, I would think. It really, really does. And like there are some things that some like like events that happen where I'm like, how the fuck did they do that? Like there's a scene where they're at a house party and all of the balconies fall c- collapse there's and then like all these people are injured yeah. and, like this doctor but like they show they make that happen yeah <laughs> and i it's, don't think it's i've excellent i, don't, it's I way... remember i sort of remember that happening although i've never i stopped watching the show at a certain point and i think i will stop watching i don't think i'm gonna watch too far past 
like when the main cast the leaves. main yeah 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 i still like i kind of like more a tyranny too so i might hang on for like a few of the more See, tyranny she, seasons she's but... in it for she she's the bridge so right. because you've got the main cast who stay around pretty much until you know it's like season se- six or something seven eight is probably when like yes yeah, six seven eight is kind of when it, they all start to like drop off but right. that that's when they bring her in and you're right. like all right well uh, i like her a lot and she's she's got a lot of good stuff going right. on like and since it is such an ensemble show it is possible to like even if you're sort of like i don't like these people or like this is whatever there's so much going on that it just like right. stays interesting it just carries you rachel if you do if you watch no other episode of er rachel you should watch the episode where from the i think second or third season where george clooney saves the little boy from yeah. the like from the um drain a drainage place, a drainage yes yes yeah and it is yeah, one of it. the greatest episodes of television that- ever and it is there you can just see like there is a moment in the show where George Clooney transforms before your eyes into a movie star, and it, it is kind of like stunning to behold. It's magical. It's TV. There it sounds that, stressful. But that it is, is stressful. It's very. That is the I think the highest rated te- television episode of like all time, or like up up till that point, the highest rated episode of all time. <laughs> oh it's so it's so good i'm so glad you're watching that better because everyone everyone i've told oh i've been watching er they're like what <laughs> like they have no, no it's it's very it's, good it's a really good show and, and then the good thing about it is you don't have to watch the whole thing you can just dip in and out every episode no. is kind of the same so you just like exactly but like still it's still like different enough that you're right. you know and there are a lot of really good guest stars and there's but it's so hard to even consider getting into something that has 15 has seasons. seasons yeah. No, but that's the point. You just watch, you just like, you kind of can just watch the good ones. Like, yeah. oh, this is supposed to be a good episode. I'll watch this one. Cause it's like, you, there's, a, there is like a serial story, but you can figure it out. Like, oh, like this episode, like George Clooney and Juliana Margulies are like, they like each other this episode. Oh, now they hate each other. You know, that's all you need to know. is like that kind of thing. That right. would be hard. I mean, it's it's hard. I think it's hard for most people these days to not be a completist to like dip in and out of things, mm. right? Because everything's there. It's not, you don't. Right. You, you, there's not really much excuse. Yeah, it, it it is hard not to be a completist. But but I I do have to say that I I watched years ago. I watched uh, Star Trek Voyager, and we decided to just skip a bunch of, it was like I don't like this character if he's like in the show description I'm not watching the episode and it made the experience of watching the show a lot more pleasant and night nice. and like I have my overall feeling of the show is so much better I'm like oh Voyager is actually a really good show you think about a show like ER that was on in like the 90s right that was before people had DVR yeah. Right. So like there wasn't the expectation necessarily that people were going to watch every single episode because like, you know, sometimes you weren't going to be home on a Thursday night at 10 o'clock or whatever. So you wouldn't see every single one. And so therefore the show is not designed where you have to be a complete. It's, it's sort of designed for you to be able to watch. All right. So none of them were basically the only shows that were designed for you to watch everything would be a miniseries. Right. Yes. And I think um, that's why it was built that way. I yeah. had a I had a boyfriend who loved Twin Peaks. Stop bragging. You had a boyfriend? <laughs> I had one. And he loved Twin Peaks, but he hated a few of the characters and storylines. And he re-edited the entire show and cut out everything involving Josie and the Mill and those characters. Oh, I like Josie. In- Me too. <laughs> and what's the guy's name who put the there's a fish in the percolator? He cut out Catherine and her husband and Josie and the Mill. What? And and he cut out Norma and Hank, and he cut everything with those characters out, and it doesn't make a lick of difference in the show, basically. Um, and then I watched that version. But what I I, watching, hate, I hate that Rachel. <laughs> what I watching is well, so I've been watching on and off the second season of Disenchantment. It's like that. It's the Matt Groening show. Groening show. He did Simpsons, Futurama, and it's another one, but it's on Netflix and it's set in like a medieval. Abby Jacobson does the voice of the main character. She's a princess and there's magic and stuff. Not funny at all, but like oh. it's so short. I'm like, I'll just get through it. So I've been half heartedly getting through that. 
the animation is actually really good. I kind of enjoy watching the animation. The background design is really nice. But we watch Seinfeld sometimes. And the other day we watched the one where George tries to piss off his parents by starting to date his cousin. And then his cousin is really into it. And so like half the episode is her trying to have sex with him and him being skeeved out. Oh, that gross. Was really <laughs> funny that would never be on TV. It's just a cousin. Who cares? I know, right? But I no, mean, I'm saying if they're hot. Seinfeld is still so funny. So funny. I mean, Kramer especially. Like, I just cannot believe. Like, he just comes, like, he literally walks in the door and I start laughing. I thought that after watching every episode 25 times, I might, might have lost its sheen. But I mean, you break for 10 years, you come back. There's some shows that, I mean, are remembered for a reason, you know? Because they are, like, consistently good and, you know, they stand the test of time, so. Did you watch, and you'd only watch some of Voyager, right? Because only I used to watch, some. I used to watch Voyager. I remember liking it a lot, but I also was watching it at a time when there was literally nothing else to watch. And then when I've tried to go back and watch it, it's, I so, would, it's just so goofy. I would suggest my strategy. Um <laughs> Did you watch every watch episode, every Angie? just every episode that has to do with the doctor um with Janeway like just like the there is a couple characters where you're like yes if it's about them it's going to be a good episode yeah. um this and then sort just of how I feel about the sopranos else. I always wish I could just only watch the parts of the sopranos that had Carmela and Adriana in them. Yeah, and oh my god. All the parts with like about that are about like the mob. Bennett every year when we put up the Christmas tree, I'm always doing a Carmela impression because she, she's there's this one scene in Sopranos where she's just like sitting in a room alone and she's like, I'm just enjoying the tree. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I also I did watch one other thing. Um, I watched a Netflix true crime show called uh, what was it called? Crime scene. The vanishing at the C Cecil Hotel. Isn't there a point midway in every Netflix true crime show where you just turn it off and go to Wikipedia and find out what happened and Co maybe correct a bunch of hours? But like, I still keep coming back to the true crime <laughs> stuff, even though it even was podcasts. Like, I was listening to one and I thought, I'm just gonna Google it. I can't. I can't do this. <laughs> I just can't. Yeah, but yeah, it was about the girl who, like, from Vancouver, who was visiting LA and like m went missing, and then ended up in like the water tank of this hotel. And the the way that the show tells a story, you're very creeped out for the first two episodes, and then the third episode, you figure out what happens, and you're like, "All right, that's interesting," and but it's not really anything that it's just like she you know had a manic episode and you know they, they were setting up a lot of creepy stuff that they couldn't deliver and then the fourth episode is just oh you know isn't it so sad that she died and like we should really care about people with mental illness and i was like yeah you just spent this like this whole show exists to exploit this woman <laughs> and I'm now you're need more crimes soon that's the problem they're running out of crime they are they are in contrast the stupid killer when you need him <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Bennett, for joining us. This has been a pleasure. It was fun. I'll come talk to you about TV anytime. Well, this has been Sliders and Wings with Val and Rachel. Yes, it has. Thank you, Bennett. Thank you for having me. Bye. Bye. Bye.